Good morning and welcome to this Baltic Breakfast Seminar on essential uses of substitution of hazardous chemicals. Uh, this seminar is organized by Stockholm University Baltic Sea Center, uh, we're a scientific center and part of Stockholm University. With us today uh, we have Professor Ian Cassins and Dr. Lisa Schedung. My name is Marie Löv, uh, I'm a research scientist and I also work with policy at the Baltic Sea Center. Our topic today is hazardous chemicals and how the concept of essential uses and substitution can help us to achieve a safer and more sustainable use of chemicals. We'll focus on a group of chemicals uh, that are highly relevant in this context and that is PFAS. There have been a spotlight uh, lately, both from a regulatory and environmental point of view. Uh, these are very persistent substances, uh, also called forever chemicals and they ac accumulate in organisms and some of them are known to be toxic. You probably heard of uh, environmental disasters lately, uh, for example in Italy uh, and the pollution in Belgium uh, where a production plant for these chemicals led to uh, contamination. Also here in Sweden uh, where PFAS use has polluted groundwater and drinking water for humans. Today only two PFAS are regulated, and that is PFOS and PFOA. But regulatory action is picking up. About 200 uh, PFAS uh, will be uh, banned uh, or regulated uh, within the European Union with beginning in uh, 2023. And there is also uh, a complete phasing out of PFAS within the European Union to be expected. Uh, unless their use is essential. So then it becomes very important how we define what essential use is of chemicals. And of course, essential use and uh, substitution is really relevant concepts that are uh, applicable for much wider use of chemicals and substances than only PFSs, which we will touch upon today. So I would like to start giving the word uh, to Professor Ian Cousins. Ian is a uh, professor at uh, professor in environmental chemistry uh, at the Department of Environmental Science here at Stockholm University. He's an expert on PFAS and he has applied the concept of essential use to PFAS uh, and thus given it new life. So now we'll learn more about essential use, uh, especially in relation to PFAS. So please, Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for that nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about essential use and specifically how essential use, the essential use concept can be applied to aid the phase out of these substances called PFAS and also potentially other hazardous chemicals from society. So first of all, what are PFAS? Well, many of you have already probably heard of these um, in, the pub in the media, um, but PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And according to the new OECD definition, this is any substance that contains at least a CF2 or CF3 unit in the structure. And the consequence of such a broad definition means that there are thousands of PFAS in use in society. And in fact, there are more than 200 different uses of PFAS. Um, and why have they been used in society? Well, they're very useful as surfactants, or you can think of them like a little bit like detergents, or as also surface protectors in products, for example, like our Gore-Tex jackets or our um, PTFE frying pans. Now, the, the problem with PFAS is that because of this very strong carbon fluorine bond, that all of the substances in this class are highly persistent. They will never break down in the environment, which has led them to have the nickname the forever chemicals. Um, and some of these substances are also bioaccumulative and toxic to wildlife and humans. Here's a couple of the sort of usual suspects in the PFAS class of the two that have been regulated so far, PFOA and PFOS on the bottom. As you can see, they have this typical surfactant structure with this long hydrophobic tail and hydrophilic head. So a few years ago, <clears throat> we got very concerned about this large class of substances and we published this statement called the Madrid Statement. And uh, this was signed by many international scientists around the world. Um, and why were we concerned? Because, well, uh, we, 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 well, first of all, we thought the production and use of PFAS should be limited in society. And this was based on concerns regarding the high high, extremely high persistence that I, I mentioned on the previous slide. 
and also the lack of knowledge of most of the substances in the class. We know a, a fair amount about a few substances in the class, but nearly nothing about most of the other substances in the class regarding their properties, uses, and toxicity. So this is when we started to come, about, come up with the essential use concept, because we realized that because they were so sort of used so widely in society, that we couldn't phase them out overnight. So um, we decided instead that the essentiality of PFAS should be carefully tested against the available evidence for each of their uses. And given the thousands of PFAS on the market and their many uses, we realized that this is a formidable task. Uh, and the idea of essentiality isn't totally new. It, it, it came from the Montreal Protocol, um, which focused, focused on um, ozone-depleting substances. And we decided to adapt the definition of essentiality from the Montreal Protocol. And as I said, initially, we applied this concept to phasing out of PFAS, and we published this paper, a whole bunch of us, in only quite recently, in 2019. So we came up with three different categories for uh, essential use or essentiality. Category one are the non-essential uses. These uses are not essential for health and society and the functioning of society. I'll come back to the functioning, uh, functioning of society a bit later. Um, the uses of, these uh, uses of the substances is driven primarily by market opportunity. And a couple of examples are um, the use of PFAS in bike chain lubricants and also in fluorinated ski waxes which we'll come back to a bit later, and also Lisa. Um, and the second category is substitutable uses. These are uses that have come to be regarded as essential by society because they perform important functions, but where alternatives of the substances have now been developed that have equi equivalent functionality. And some of these uses are the use in um, firefighting foams that we, we, that we call AFFFs, uh, aqueous film forming foams and also in certain water-resistant uh, textiles, like our Gore-Tex jackets. And the third category is essential uses. These are uses that, considered, that are considered essential by society because they are necessary for health or safety or other highly important purposes, which we'll come back to. Um, and for example, this could be the use of, in medical devices or in oc occupational protective clothing. For example, a, a surgeon working in the theater um, during a long operation needs to have very good protection against biological fluids and viruses. So, and, and PFAS offer very good repellency against a wide polarity of liquids. So this could be considered an essential use. But any essential use should not be considered permanent. Um, there should be a constant pressure um, applied so that alternatives can be brought forward to, to replace these so-called essential uses. So I'm just gonna run through a few case studies. I think it's easy to under understand the concept when you go through some case studies. So I'll start with, bike chain lubricants, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but you, you may have noticed that if you've ever used a bike chain lubricant that they often have with PTFE on the actual lubricant label. And so about one to 25% of PTFE um, per weight is usually added to the um, um, lubricant and it's supposed to slightly increase the performance of the, of the lubrication. Uh, Sometimes a small amount of PTF is added just for marketing purposes. So they add just about 1% or a bit less, and they, this helps them sell it because for some reason, having with PTFE on the label has become a positive marketing strategy. So now you can sell your bike chain lubricants it has with, with PTFE on it. Um, and it's still, even with PTFE, it's still marketed as biodegradable and eco-friendly, which is what, what we would probably call greenwashing because the PTFE will never ever degrade in the environment, so it's certainly not biodegradable. Um, there are alternatives. There are PTFE free, free lubricants, for example, plant-based products. And you know, we had a workshop on this topic and it, it became clear to us that the PTFE marginally increases lubricating performance, but it's certainly not essential, um, this extra performance that you get. So this is our, what I would say is a, a, a classical category one non-essential use. The second use is very famous in Sweden because in a lot of the military bases in Sweden have been using these so-called firefighting foams, these aqueous film forming foams. And these are special foams that can extinguish so-called class B fuel fires. So they're only supposed to be used for extinguishing fuel fires. Um, and as a result of using these, actually not to put out fires, but to train to put out fires over many decades, a lot of the ground waters in Sweden have become, irre well, not irreversibly, but nearly, poorly reversibly, 
contaminated with, with um, PFAS. And this has led to some lawsuits that you may have heard about in Uppsala and also in uh, Ronneby and in, in, in Blekinge. Um, but there have been fluorine-free Class B foams available since the 2000s. And now people are realizing that these meet the standard firefighting performance certifications. And many commercial airports, basically all the commercial airports in Scandinavia, have phased out these firefighting foams and replaced them with these 3F fluorine-free foams instead. Um, there's still some resistance, um, globally at least, uh, about phasing out these, these firefighting foams, but I would class them as category two. There are alternatives. There are some people who say that you still need these um, AFFFs because in some emergencies, they're the most effective way of putting out big fires. So they could be category three in some emergency cases. The third case study is the um, example of uh, repellent textiles. And this is a complicated case study because you uh, depending on the performance requirements you need, you, you, they fall into different categories. So for leisure wear, everyday leisure wear, like um, water repellent surface shorts um, or a, a jacket that you, you might wear, wear to, the, to the beach or something, you really don't need this um, water and um, um, stain repellency. Uh, for category two, where you need slightly better water repellency, there are alternatives um, available now on the market, you may have noticed this in the store that uh, a lot, there are a lot of PFAS-free products available now, but there's still some categories in occupational clothing which would be considered to be essential uses. Um, okay, so coming back to this essential for the functioning of society beyond health and safety, so how broadly should essentiality be interpreted? Well, Chemsec have turned this on its head a little bit and they've asked when is the use of hazardous chemicals acceptable? And they would say that hazardous chemicals should be considered non-essential for making or if they're in consumer products. Um, and so, but this has led to some resistance from industry where they pointed out, like for example, the metal industry contacted me and said, does that mean that all stainless steel is non, should be considered non-essential if we need, for example, hazardous metals to make them, for example, nickel? So this, is a, this has been a bit controversial. Um, and there was also multiple stakeholder workshops earlier this year when they asked what is essential beyond health and safety and uh, it actually became very, very broad. Um, some people su suggested that well-being, cultural heritage, education, energy, if we need chemicals for these different things, um, maybe these are also essential uses. And so all of a sudden the, the idea of essentiality became much broader than we had originally, re originally envisaged it. And then um, Chemsec have um, posted their kind of meme as a kind of um, a response products. So there's a bit of a debate about how broad this essentiality definition should be. Uh, so my conclusions regarding the application of essentiality. Um, in many uses of PFAS, uh, there are alternatives. We see again and again for every case study, there are alternatives. Of course, you need to evaluate these alternatives, and quite often we don't need, know that much about the alternatives, and that's definitely a problem that needs to be improved. Many phase-outs of PFAS have occurred and, or are occurring, or efforts are going on to, to, to lead to these phase-outs. Um, and the whole discussion about the uses has been valuable in itself. Uh, We've noted that industrial uses require expert knowledge. So the consumer products are relatively easier compared to industrial uses of PFAS. And we have to ask industry for help in those cases. And you see in the paper in the bottom that we've gone through a whole bunch of different case studies and looked at the different um, use requirements you need in different, in, different, uh, in different cases where we've applied the essential use concept. Um, and the challenges that are remaining are really is a big challenge. How broadly should essentiality be defined? Uh, and the controversial areas are when you start applying the essential, uh, essentiality concept to services or products and you start saying, oh, is a particular product um, essential or non-essential? For example, do we need non-stick cookware in society? Um, do we need stainless steel? Um, and so on. So those, those kind of things have become quite controversial. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail, maybe we can take this up in discussion, but there's an ongoing process to try and uh, implement the essential use concept within the um, European Union um, chemicals regulation. 
And I'm kind of on the outside of this looking in, so I don't know that much more than most people, but uh, it's an ongoing process and it's going to be interesting to follow what happens over the next, uh, over the next uh, few years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. That was very interesting mm. and uh, clarifying, I think. Uh, so we hear this problem, so how, how broadly uh, essentiality should be uh, defined when it comes to these functions and, and terms that you defined. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts on this now, since you started off uh, with this concept, thinking of PFASIS, and now you're broadening uh, the scope of it? Yeah, it, it's a difficult one. I, 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 I'm more on chemsex line, where it should be fairly narrow, the definition. It shouldn't get too broad, because if it gets too broad, then we're really not improving the whole regulation process. It comes to being extremely complicated and similar to what we have today. Um, we bring in sort of socioeconomic aspects and so on into the into the discussion, for example. So, um, but there are, can be it can be wider than just health and safety. For example, the PFAS is used a lot in batteries, and we we think batteries are great now in our cars, right? Um, for as, for climate change, uh, um, but uh, we do use a lot of PFAS in batteries. Um, so you know, it, should that be an essential use? Um, maybe. So there can be it can be broad. It could be energy use. Maybe could be could be one thing where you could expand it to, but yeah, this uh, this discussion is 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 tricky. Mm. I don't think it should be well-being. I think that's maybe pushing it a cultural heritage and so on. I don't know. There's there, it's getting very broad when you start bringing in those kind of socio-economic yeah um, discussions. Thank you. Mm. I hope that we have time to come back to this mm. in the discussion. So uh, our next uh, speaker today uh, is Dr. Lisa Fiedung. Uh, Lisa has a PhD in surface chemistry. Uh, she works at RISE Research Institutes of Sweden uh, as a project manager for Pop Free. That's a project that aims to contribute to the transition into a world that is free from non-essential use of PFAS. And you work with substitution, uh, product development and communication. So please, Lisa, tell us about your work. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, yeah, so the, the vision of Pop3 is a systemic change where PFAS free products are the natural choice both for producers and for consumers. Um, so in Pop3 we work with development, testing and risk assessment of alternatives. We also work with communication to increase awareness uh, from producer to consumer. And the third aspect that we're working with is also impact policy and legislation with partners such as Chemsection, Mekalinspektionen and Naturskyddsföreningen. Um, so besides firefighting foam, uh, most focus has been on more consumer products, uh, where PFAS uh, mainly contributes to this nice-to-have function rather than essential function. Um, we do see an increased awareness and willingness to substitute purposes to safer alternatives and solutions, uh, not least among the pop free partners. Uh, we also see increased awareness by consumers, uh, but it's very challenging to make adequate choices as a consumer, uh, because on many products you don't really know what the chemical content is, it, it doesn't have to be listed. Uh, and there's also many sort of greenwash attempts, um, so it's it, so it's quite challenging. For example, uh, it's quite often that you see a green label where it, where it says PFOA free, uh, and it just does just say that it doesn't contain PFOA, but it does contain other PFAS chemicals. But as as a consumer, it's very hard to know that. You think that this green label is a sustainable choice. Um, and we also have the bike loop that Ian addressed, that it says sort of biodegradable and PTFE on the same bottle. But as a consumer, if you don't know what PTFE is, is you think that you make uh, a sustainable uh, choice when you purchase that product. Um, so here, consumers uh, think uh, that, I mean, basically all products on the market have been rigorously tested and that they are safe and... Um, so that they're, they tr these consumers trust industry, or at least they have. Uh, 
So when it comes to the essential use concept, uh, Kim Sek, who is a partner in Pop3, states that it's not about the importance of specific products, but it's more about when we can accept hazardous substances. Uh, so if I ask a consumer, for example, is it essential to use uh, fluorinated ski waxes? So if I'm a recreational ski skier, I may say, yes, of course. I want to succeed with the personal best and manage the medal time at uh, Vasaloppet. But if we ask the same recreational skier in this case, is it justified to use hazardous chemicals in ski waxes? Uh, the answer would probably be different. It could be... Uh, for example, no, of course not. I'm not aware of that because the awareness is, 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 is maybe lacking. Do you mean that hazardous chemicals are used despite industry knowing that they are not good for, for humans or the environment? Uh, in the Pop Free Ski Vax case, uh, our brand partners has, uh, have developed new PFAS free ski waxes during the project, uh, Sfix and Red Creek. And we also found out in a survey that uh, recreational skiers are willing to ski without PFAS as long as, it, as long as the elite skier also do that. So we invited stakeholders in the ski sport to a workshop and we together drafted a roadmap towards PFAS free skiing. This was in 2019. Uh, and actually a couple of months later, the International Ski Federation uh, decided on a total floral ban in all skiing disciplines. And this is something that is now planned to be implemented during next season because they are now developing this fluorine tracker to be used to check the skis before competition. Uh, but this is also interesting that since when the FIS ban was announced, uh, some companies had already started to, to phase out PFAS, but then suddenly innovation started among all ski brands. So now, even though the implementation is not there yet, all companies have, have uh, developed PFAS-free uh, products that is now uh, available on the market. So this shows that regulations speed up uh, innovation. Uh, if we ask a consumer, is it essential to use cosmetics? Of course, uh, most people would say. It's used, I use it every day because I want to look beautiful and it's part of my daily routine. But if we instead ask a consumer, is it, hazardous, uh, is it justified to use hazardous chemicals in cosmetic? The answer would probably uh, be no, of course not. I'm not aware of that. Do you mean that hazardous chemicals are used despite industry knowing that they are not good for humans uh, or the environment? In the pop-free uh, cosmetic case, uh, we did find uh, PFASs in uh, different types of products. But at the same time, we also found that the same type of products with a similar claim with, or with the same claim didn't contain PFAS. So here we thought that there are al alternatives already. Um, and H&M, who was a, a partner in pop-free, uh, they have phased out PFAS in their cosmetics. And for, for them, substitution required a new formulation rather than a one-to-one -one, uh, ingredient substitution. Uh, Chemical Inspektionen recently published a, a report about PFAS and cosmetics, if you are interested in, in reading more about that. Um, in the pop-free uh, food paper case, we have had partners um, uh, one partner, partner Nordic Paper, has developed uh, more of, of a new solution uh, where they mechanically uh, treat the fibers and make a very, very dense paper surface. And this very dense paper surface acts as a natural barrier against grease. So that's more of a new solution, new thinking instead of uh, chemical replacement. Uh, we also have Billerud Korsnes that has developed a plant-based paper coating uh, free from uh, PFAS. Um, it's interesting because in Denmark the use of all PFAS in paper and board for food packaging uh, has been banned since July 2020. And there was a recent study uh, in the EU that showed uh, no PFAS uh, in disposable food packaging uh, samples from Denmark. But the same items from Czech Republic and UK showed quite rather high amounts of PFAS. 
So this again shows that regulations are an effective tool to push industry players to find uh, safer alternatives. Uh, in the pop-free uh, textile case, which is kind of uh, where we have a lot of focus now in pop-free stage three, uh, where we have OrganoClick as a partner who develops bio-based and biodegradable uh, durable water repellent treatments for textiles. Uh, so we are going from lab scale to upscaling to pilot scale and we are now doing uh, pilot tests in collaboration with Bergens and Houdini in factory trials in Asia. And we see that water resistance is feasible but it's still challenging to get the degrees and dirt repellents and the same type of durability as you can get for, with the treatments containing uh, PFAS. Um, so to summarize, um, there are many PFAS-free alternatives on the market already, which is also a key for the essential use, that there are, um, that there are alternatives available. Um, and there is a lot of ongoing work within industry to, to really uh, work with this and to really find safer alternatives and solutions. Uh, we have seen uh, that regulations initiate new development and innovation and really speed up uh, phase out work. Um, focus also, as Ian said, it's a lot of PFAS uses. So focus uh, should be also to look at when it's justified to use hazardous chemicals. Uh, also, so that we limit the, ne the need of expert judgments because it shouldn't be too complicated uh, because that will take so much time. Um, and risk assessment and life cycle assessment of, uh, has been highlighted as a key point in POP3 uh, to make sure that the alternatives are safer and better from an environmental perspective. And this is also challenging because industry, it's, it's sort of secret what, what's in there instead. Um, so this is a challenge. Uh, in in POP3 we have had one, maybe two persons who have sort of received information from the, part, from the partners in the project. Uh, so all partners have been offered this possibility to, to evaluate their alternatives. But it's not that it's sort of known by all the partners what, what it is instead. So it's a, it's a challenge about the, the chemical, chemical content. And this is a challenge for an effective dialogue and collaboration in the value chain. But it, it's also a uh, hinders consumer trust because the consumer wants to know okay but what is used instead and if they don't know that it's it's it it hinders the, the trust i would say so thank you very much thank you so much lisa that was really interesting to hear about i think you're really onto something with the need for transparency uh, on the chemicals in the products that we that we use but I think that what you're talking about in Pop Free and your work, it seems to be such a great opportunity for industry to be able to cooperate with you. Uh, has it been uh, a lot of companies that you haven't been able to, to work with uh, that were willing to uh, participate in this project? Uh, we have, um, um, I mean, there, we see a great interest and we also now try to, to broaden to more complicated products products that we have not focused on so far. So we want to, to aim for a continuation of Popri, which ends, uh, this project ends uh, September 2022, with we aims for a continuation in another form, mm -hmm. uh, where we also want to invite, uh, uh, expand the product categories and uh, sort of processes and to also more complicated, uh, this more borderline between is it essential or not? Mm. But still, where you, even though you define from the beginning that it may be essential, it should not be essential forever. So you, you always have to, sh you, you still have to show that you actively work with finding alternatives. Yeah. So you cannot be happy with, okay, this is essential, I don't have to do anything. You still have to show that you actively work to find alternatives. Mm. Uh, so we, let's hope for a. Continuation. Yeah, I, could, I could add something there. I think even within the same sector, you see differences of opinion. So, for example, in the PTFE cookware, there's a well-known retailer in Sweden um, 
that has now phased out um, PTFE cook mm. there. And you can see, you know, they've got posters in the stores there. And, and uh, um, it's very impressive that they move so quickly. But in, the, in that sector, for example, in Germany, I know one of my colleagues is finding enormous resistance from PTFE cookware. So it's um, even within the same sector, sometimes there's large differences of mm. opinion. I think when it comes to, to non-stick also, we, within Popfree now we have, we have a, 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 non-stick I think is one of the ca product categories for consumers are most aware of that they, they actually contain PFAS or mm. may contain PFAS. Mm. So in Popfree now we have uh, invited uh, the kitchenware industry first to a webinar to, to sort of spread awareness about PFAS and, uh, and then we also had a workshop where we invited uh, companies mm -hmm. um, to see if we can initiate a collaboration within the kitchenware industry because basically all of them fa are facing the same problem. So if we could collaborate and share information and sort of help each other how to communicate with suppliers, for example, that would sort of also uh, be maybe less effort for each company if collaboration is is uh, taking place and also maybe speed up as well mm. so that so that every company doesn't have to do it themselves so we can sort of collaborate uh, together yeah. to uh, in this topic that sounds like a win-win situation I've been very sort of inspired by this pop free project and it basically shows you also that there's many good actors in industry that there's a lot of um, incentives in industry to to make sustainable products and that has been inspiring in to me uh, yeah definitely yeah and I mean there are companies that are have already phased out PFAS mm. so they are actually going before a broader EU uh, regulation enters into force so that mm. also shows that there is a great willingness and uh, for, for sustainability. I think that's really, that's really inspiring to hear because I've also seen that uh, some parts of the industry are also forming uh, groups and are a bit uh, uh, maybe skeptical to this grouping uh, uh, approach and essential use and a bit worried that too many PFSs will be uh, regulated or banned. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's very good to hear about these positive examples, I think. Mm. Okay, I think I would like to uh, also let in our last uh, participant today, uh, Dr. Ulrika Dahl. Do we have Ulrika with us now? Uh, Ulrika Dahl is uh, a scientific officer and project manager uh, for essential use at Swedish Chemicals Agency. And she also has a PhD in applied environmental science. I would like to thank you so much, Ulrika, for joining us. Um, could you please tell us uh, the views of the Swedish Chemicals Agency on the concept of uh, essential juice in relation to uh, PFAS and uh, maybe in a broader perspective? Yes. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I would like to also thank, thank you for the great presentations ahead of me. I will keep this shortly today. Uh, and. We have been talking a lot about PFAS, uh, but at the Swedish Chemicals Agency, KEMI, uh, we're working, of course, on PFAS also, but the essential uses concept that I am the project leader of is broader than the PFAS, uh, as the PFAS part is the part of the essential use concept. Uh, our work has its starting point in the European chemical strategy, which came into place about a year ago. Uh, and we started this work last spring and have since then been working uh, to come up with a proposal of a definition and also overarching principles on this concept. Um, essential uses should, and I will quote Heidmere, uh, the chemical strategy, it should ensure that the most harmful chemicals are allowed, are only allowed if their use is necessary for health, safety, or is critical for the functioning of society and if there are no alternatives available from the standpoint of environment and health. So, as you can hear, this is undeniably a broad call. Uh, and in addition to this, the concept should also run across all relevant legislations, not just REACH. It's also worth noting here that we find a new concept, uh, which is most harmful, 
And the definition of that is a bit broader than the traditional ACHE, which is substances of very high concern. Uh, we also want to highlight innovation, of course, and non-chemical alternatives as solutions in our work. Uh, so the timeline ahead is that during this autumn, we're working out uh, to, try, uh, to try out a proposal for draft legislations and to look closer on um, how we could get this concept to fit into other relevant legislations within the EU. Thank you. Uh, sounds like uh, very ambitious and a bit of challenging work, but sure is much needed. But very, very interesting, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you also have, uh, have some uh, information on the ongoing work uh, in the Commission regarding essential uses? I have some information. Uh, they have launched a consultant study, uh, which I believe will be delivered in July 2022. And here, uh, as far as I know, the consultants will, among other things, look at which legislations may be relevant for this concept. Uh, and initially, according to the strategy, uh, the concept would be ready by 2021, 2022. But it's, of course, now clear that it will be no sooner than 2022. So that's as much as I know about that at this point. Thank you so much, Ulrika, and thank you thank for you. joining us. Uh, if you want to, uh, please stay with us if there are questions that you uh, would like also to address. Of course. Um, I would like to start with a, questions from, uh, a question from the audience. So, are PFAS uses more widespread among consumers, consumer uses or industrial uses? Yeah, I can check that if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, that, the, the answer to that question also, also depends on the PFAS. I would say on, on the whole, it's probably industrial uses which, which dominate um, over consumer uses. If you take for example PFOA, the, 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 which is one of the well-known PFAS, the reason we have so much PF, PFOA in the global environment at least is the historical use in uh, as a processing aid for making PTFE. So you may have seen the movie Dark Waters and that's all about the emissions from the um, basically the, the factory that, that made the, the PTFE in, in the US and uh, they contaminated the whole area around the factory. So um, probably the biggest single use of PFAS is in fluoropolymers, things like PTFE. Um, and fluoropolymers are used a lot in industrial applications. So if you just took sort of total production volumes of all PFAS, then I think you would find it was fluoropolymers that were dominating and it was industrial uses of fluoropolymers mm. which were dominating. But it's hard to get figures for all of these things mm. actually and information as it comes back to transparency to get numbers for how much is produ produced and you you have to go to industry marketing reports sometimes and you don't know how reliable they are um, so getting numbers on production is not always easy mm. <laughs> strangely in our society we can't even find out these, these things <clears throat> it's a bit better in Scandinavia because we have these product registers that are a bit more transparent than in other countries but then fluoropolymers as you said it's, it's very widely used, but also in consumer products, uh, the bike yeah, oils and, yeah, and non-stick and mm. uh, cosmetics. You have mm. maybe PTFE powder particles, yeah. um, even though I think much of it has been removed. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it's also used. It's it's fluoropolymers are very, very like useful. Like use. The roof of Bloomberg or whatever is like a fluoropolymer, basically. So it's... <laughs> It's used, they're used a lot in building materials and uh, um, all sorts of in tubings and uh, coatings and things in industrial applications. Electronics. Yeah. Thank you. But in weird things as well, you wouldn't expect like guitar strings and climbing ropes and... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Dental so floss. Are these den yeah, all sorts of things you wouldn't expect that we kind of realised when we started looking into all of the uses of PFAS. Mm. Yep. Uh, it's going to be interesting to try to uh, define this essentiality. Mm. Uh, so, uh, I also know that um, it's not only within the EU that things are happening around mm. essentiality and PFAS regulation, for example. Also, the Biden administration uh, mm. has proposed a strategy for dealing with PFAS. And that also has uh, mm. kind of essentiality and grouping in it. Um, how important would you say that it is that also the United States follows 
yeah. uh, the same kind of regulatory pathway that uh, yeah, obviously it's important that we have can, global action on yeah. the substances, but the I would national legislation on PFAS is going to be tricky in the US, but on the state level. I can definitely see a lot of things happening. For example, in Maine, they already introduced the essential use concept into law. So there are very progressive states within the US which, are, which have brought in quite progressive um, chemical legislation. So California and some of the states in New England are much more progressive than some of the other states. I think we know this when we see the, the, map, the blue and red on the maps mm. uh, when we will follow the US election. Um, and it's the same with chemicals uh, policy. So quite often the, the states have quite aggressive chemicals, um, chemicals regu regulation, but the, it's quite hard to implement this on the national level in the US because it, you know, you, when you get to the national level, you have a lot, you know, the, polit the politics is going to become much trickier. So the, you have a kind of quite often watered down regulation, but it'd be interesting to see if they manage on the national level with uh, PFAS. Yeah. That would be uh, astounding. Yeah. I have uh, a bit more detailed question maybe for you, Lisa. Um, but you, Ian, you mentioned uh, these bike chain lubricants that are market, marketed as bio-based and biodegradable and environmental friendly. But are you really allowed to market something as uh, biodegradable if they contain uh, PFAS or PTFE? Yeah, I mean, they, the company that does that, does, they don't do anything wrong, really. Because uh, you can say that something is biodegradable as long as I think it's 60% of the content degrades within uh, 28 days, but nothing has to be sort of said about the the other 40%. So it's um, so they don't really do anything wrong, um, and it's a very effective way I think to to to, to fool the, law, the consumer according to the law, but according I mean, to the law yeah. but it's a very <laughs> effective way to sort of fool yeah. consumers because many consumers want to buy sustainable products. They want to buy what's sort of more better for the environment and, and for, the for, for themselves. Um, and if you don't know this and you have no idea because you don't have to, the ingredients doesn't have to be listed on the package. So the only thing you can go for is what's on the, on the package. And if it says biodegradable in green, uh, labeling, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's easy to think that you make a sustainable choice. Well, maybe that's a piece of legislation that needs to be addressed as well. Yeah, I think and so. That would help. Uh, um, maybe I would like to round off uh, with a final question mm -hmm. to all three of you. Mm -hmm. uh, we could start perhaps with uh, Ulrika. What change would you most like to see in relation to um, either chemicals production, use or regulation? when it comes to these topics that we have addressed here today? Uh, the ch oh, that's, a, that's a heavy question though, but I would like the change I would see like to see is a uh, more rapid phase out of substances of very high concern to mm. protect consumers. Thank you. Basically. Lisa. Yeah, I mean, rapid phase out, I agree. And also we have addressed it that it's uh, you want to, to, to change to safer alternatives, but you, we also need to be able to, to assess these alternatives to really say that they are safer from, from, for humans and the environment. So how do we do that? How, how could we assure that if we don't have the information about what's in the products instead? Yeah. Thank you. Ian? Yeah, I've been I've been working on this issue for about twenty years, and and but PFAS have been made for more than seventy years, and I think the the frustration I find is that how long time it's ta taken to to get to where we are now, and it's only been in the last few years that the issue of PFAS has become raised up, and we now see it in in the public media. For a long time, there was I knew about the problem, but there was nothing happening. It was difficult to get funding. Um, we've got to get better at at uh, finding these problems and, and, and doing something about them in, in society. We're not reacting fast enough. Um, and, uh, and that's why we have all of the issues now and we have to spend a lot of money now um, cleaning up the environment to remove mm. PFAS from a lot of locations. So um, how do we do that? I don't know all the answers to that, but we've got to be better at it, um, communicating between the different actors in society. Um, 
industry knew about this problem a long time ago. Um, and uh, the rest of us have been catching up. So we've got to be better at uh, reacting. So hopefully the work that you do, mm. uh, both on substitution and essential use, could address mm. uh, this issue, yeah. at least partly. Definitely. Yeah. So. Thank you so much, Ulrika Lisa Nien, mm. for participating today. And uh, please look out for the next Baltic Breakfast Seminar. Uh, it's coming in November, maybe as early as November 10th already. But uh, keep an eye out on our website. Uh, thank you so much for listening in today. And if you had some more questions that we didn't have time to address today, uh, we'll post some answers on our website. Thank you.